second biggest news All right, let's get the meeting started. Hello, good evening, everyone. Microphone not working. The microphone is, is right here, my voice there is, uh, it's not connected to these speakers, I don't think. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Markov. I'm your host for this evening. Welcome to the Toronto Centre RAC Recreational Astronomy Night for uh, August. And uh, hello to our YouTube audience as well. Um, Thank you for coming, by the way, with uh, this, uh, you know, today's technology. I'm glad we have such a good turnout. Uh, so let's see, our speakers for tonight are uh, Dennis Gray, the sky this month, followed by Ron McNaughton, how ancients predicted eclipses. And uh, finally, we'll have uh, Professor David uh, Nobes from uh, the Department of uh, Geophysics, East China University of Technology, and he'll talk to us about uh, time-lapse 3D imaging in um, the Antarctic Dry Valleys, an analog for Mars. Very interesting topic. Um, all right, so those are the speakers. We'll have the announcements towards the end. And before I forget, we have some more solar viewers uh, free of charge. Please grab one or two for family and friends. There they are. And understand we have more somewhere if, if needed. And uh, show of hands, who's here for the first time? Uh, new members or not, or just members of the public dropping in to say hello. Right. Welcome, hope you enjoy the meeting. And I think we're good to start. So I'll call on Dennis Gray to present the sky this month. I'm assuming somebody will let me know if there's any level issue. Oh, no, levels are good. All right, good evening. Thanks, uh, Paul. Appreciate the introduction as always. Um, sky this month. Uh, let us see what... Sky this month brings... Uh, hmm. It might... Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, I was just mentioning to my friend John there, everybody who does the sky this month kind of brings their their own particular style and their own particular uh, approach to it. Um, so I like to cover these points usually and try to keep it uh, short so that we can all get out for a special event tonight if the sky is clear, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so we'll talk about the big picture. Where are we in the, the, uh, the, the year, the astronomer's year? We'll cover some highlights, talk about some events, look at some targets that you might be interested in trying to see. And then we'll have uh, a little bit about our uh, projects for the month that you might consider uh, adding to your observing uh, agenda. So the first thing is the big picture. And uh, I like, love to use this uh, picture from moonwise.co.uk. And what this picture shows us is essentially the entire night sky from sunset all the way over to dawn and where everything is. So in the, kind of in a glance, you kind of get a sense for where we are in the big picture. And this is centered on the ecliptic, so the path of the planets and the path of the sun runs right down the middle here. And you can see where I've highlighted with the arrows where all the planets are at this time of the month. Uh, this is centered as of yesterday, so Mercury is right down there in the muck with the sun, uh, visible in the southern hemisphere, pretty well gone from us. Uh, Jupiter is starting to set uh, in, the, in the west, and as it moves along in its orbital path, it's going to start to uh, dive uh, very quickly. Uh, Saturn is at its uh, best location, best time of year, pretty well uh, for us now. 
Neptune is uh, coming close to the middle of this chart, which is the opposition point for Neptune. Uranus is up around 2 in the morning, and then in the uh, morning sky, we've got Venus uh, still bright and visible there. So that's a, a little bit about uh, uh, where we are in the, in the year. So at this time of year, sometimes we have all the planets combining or congesting in one, uh, either the morning or the evening sky. Um, it's been a, it's a while, but it's really like they are just about perfectly spread out. So you pretty well have at least one planet at any given time, but you don't have that many uh, planets uh, grouping together at this point in time, although the moon is making some nice, uh, con interesting conjunctions. So in terms of the time, um, this is something I'm always interested in is sort of where we are uh, with, the, with respect to night, because night is very important to astronomers, as you know. Um, so our, right now, uh, astronomical twilight, which is our definition of night when the sun is at least um, 12 degrees below the horizon, it's getting dark enough to actually do something, and astronomical twilight kind of ends when it's 18 degrees below the horizon, it gets really dark, dark. Um, so astronomical twilight is uh, starting, uh, is from 9 o'clock, 20 to 10 until 5 in the morning. The night is only 5 hours and 57 minutes long, pure night, like in other words, the darkest part of the evening. But the good news is we're gaining, uh, oops, wrong, not daylight, night. We're gaining about three and three quarter minutes of night per day uh, right now. So we're actually in, in, the pro, in the time of year when the change is kind of really accelerating and we're starting to see uh, the, the noticeable change. And this is why at the beginning of August, you think, oh, the summer nights are still nice and long. And then by the end of August and the CNE is over, it's like, hey, where did my summer nights go? <laughs> They're gone because by September 9th, um, the, the length of uh, the twilight is extended by almost a whole hour. The night length has uh, gone up to s almost eight hours, and we've gained almost two hours of quote-unquote astronomical prime time. So that's, <clears throat> that's important. And one of the things that this uh, graph here shows is the, the different flavors of, of night. So the, the blue here is pure daylight. This is uh, the first part of uh, twilight. This is uh, nautical twilight and astronomical twilight. So you can see here in the period from June to July, there's almost no change in the in the time here. It, it, there's very little change. But here, where we are from August to September, there's a drastic shift in the amount of night that we get as we head towards the the uh, the solstice in uh, uh, in December when we meet sort of maximum night. So. There we go. That's a little bit about where we are this time of the year. So we talked a little bit about the planets. Um, there are some uh, highlights, I think, in the morning sky mostly. Um, you can easily see Venus right now. Um, there will be a good apparition of Mercury coming up in the morning sky in September. It's not really happening now, so I'm kind of giving you a preview of next month's sky this month. Whoever was doing it will be uh, probably highlighting um, uh, sorry, I'm getting Mars and Mercury mixed up. They both start with M. That's why. Um, but in the Mars is in the morning sky right now. It's near Regulus, so there's a star to help you find it. It's a bit faint, and there will be some good conjunctions in September. Uh, Uranus is, like I say, getting up very early in the morning, and Neptune will reach opposition, which is at its brightest and best sort of for the year around September 5th. All right, so Mercury, that's what I just said. Uh, it's best operation starting next month. Uh, Saturn is uh, very low in the south right now. It's actually about as low as it can go near Sagittarius. So the seeing is generally, eh. so you can see the rings, you can see the gaps in the rings, you can see it's really a cool planet and everything, but the crisp kind of detail that you'd like to see, you really kind of have to go to Australia to see it high up enough to actually get a really good view of it right now. But it's still an awesome planet. Uh, when I was up at the uh, National Star Party, I was at the CAO, and I was uh, doing uh, show and shares with about 50 people who showed up there, and everybody was still impressed with Saturn, even though it was a little fuzzy. Now, uh, Jupiter, it's very close to Spica. Um, it will be passing. There'll be a nice sort of photographic opportunity around August 25th when the crescent moon right after the eclipse, four days after the eclipse, is going to uh, screen by uh, the moon in its stately 
kind of way, and it'll be a nice uh, potential photo opportunity for people. The moon this month, it's going through its usual phases. There is something special happening on August 21st. Um, there is also, whoops, there was a penumbral, uh, there was a penumbral lunar eclipse uh, yesterday. Monday, sorry, wrong date again. If somebody's been reusing his slides from last winter. <laughs> I wonder, okay. Um, so, so essentially we're moving in towards the, uh, uh, the big deal here and the third quarter moon has a big implication for one of our uh, opportunities, observing opportunities and I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so the highlights this month. So there's really, um, not a lot that I was able to, to tease out of the astronomical firmament, but, but enough, I think, that we've got a pretty good month ahead. So first of all, the Perseid meteor shower is this weekend coming. Um, so first, one of the things that's nice about it is that I've conveniently scheduled the, this <coughs> meteor shower for Saturday. So, um, you know, that means it's a, it's a convenient time. It's easier for people to get out of town. It's easier for people to have an opportunity to enjoy it. Um, the only thing is that it, it will have some uh, limitations, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Obviously, we've got solar eclipse coming up on the 21st. I know we've already talked about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today. And uh, the, the summer Milky Way, sort of from the middle of August through to the end, um, the moon will be out of the way, and this will be a great opportunity for you to uh, take in the summer Milky Way. The bugs are down. Uh, the temperatures are, are getting a little cooler. Um, the sky ho is hopefully getting a little bit clearer. And we have our uh, normal city sky party, uh, star party, and dark sky star party scheduled for later this month as well. So the Perseids um, uh, are a great meteor shower, consistent, reliable, very nice to see. Um, and uh, you can see here the radiant comes from the northeast. So if you're looking uh, north, and it's about um, directly... Uh, halfway between east and north. It's just in the northeast there. And this uh, asterism here of Perseus, which is basically, you normally see these three stars, this one, uh, this one, and this one. These other stars are part of the constellation Perseus, but those three are the ones that you notice the most. And just above that is the radiant point for the Perseids. So when you see this above the horizon, then the radiant is a little bit above it. So you will be able to see some Perseids in the early part of the evening well, but the gibbous moon is going to rise around 11.30. And probably about 25, 40 minutes after that, it's going to get bright enough that it's going to start to seriously interfere with faint meteors. However, hopefully by then you have already seen about 20. You know, it's a good opportunity provided the weather uh, cooperates. Uh, current course and speed, um, my look at the weather this afternoon was... Eh, but we'll see what happens there. It's certainly worth, uh, it's always worth trying and a good opportunity to get out. Um, the other thing I did, uh, should mention, the solar eclipse is happening in Toronto too. This is mid-eclipse from Toronto here. So you can see um, that we are getting a really significant chunk of the sun uh, chopped out. I believe it's about 70, more than 70%. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean. So um, it's a very good uh, opportunity. Um, and I, you know, certainly our next eclipse of any significance is 2021. That'll be an annular eclipse uh, over Toronto and it'll be a significant like this one as well. But, you know, hopefully a lot of you are gonna get a chance to actually go and see it. Yes, sir, Ian. I just wanted to mention, so this uh, partial eclipse here, the Science Center is still looking for lots of volunteers with uh, solar telescopes, uh, solar glasses to come out on the 21st yep. and help you public That's right. Thank you. Um, the next highlight is sort of uh, one of my favorites, which is the, the summer Milky Way. So at this time of the year, this is, this is again tonight. So you can see Saturn is right down there, very, pretty low to the uh, horizon. Uh, we have Sagittarius, which is uh, part of the, the the ecliptic here, and so the, the constellation that, that Saturn is going through. Saturn's going to take another three or four years to kind of climb out of this muck and get higher enough that it'll be actually a good viewing opportunity. But the Milky Way itself, the best part of the Milky Way is seen from Canada, is right in the up, you know, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, it's right there, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great highlight of this time of the year. 
So this was the uh, event I was mentioning at the outset. We have an awesome ISS pass coming up tonight. It's it's the uh, it's the acronym for the thing. Yeah. Oh, right, right. So the International Space Station, um, which uh, is uh, a very bright satellite, it's going to be about as halfway between um, Venus and the Jupiter tonight, which is pretty bright as these things go, and it starts conveniently at 9.35. So, Paul, <laughs> it's over to you. <laughs> uh, I'm moving along. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, one of the things about this, though, is that uh, looking ahead, the visible passes of the ISS are ending around this weekend, and they're not back again until September 2nd. So, tonight is the night to see it. Yes, sir. Minus, yeah, the minus is moved over here. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. That's right. All right. So, in terms of targets, um, we don't have a. We have uh, all of the big, good constellations here: Sagittarius with lots of good stuff, Lyra with the Ring Nebula, Cygnus with uh, is the heart of the Milky Way, the star clouds there, Hercules with M13, Ophiuchus with other globular clusters. Um, I looked up for comets. There's only one that's kind of promising right now. It's looking like September, and again, that'll be next month if it if it pans out, and that's uh, C2701. Um, in terms of things to look for, first target is not a star or a cluster or anything, but actually um, dark clouds in the Milky Way. So this is known as the the Great Rift, and this this is the dark lane that you see through the Milky Way. And it's, it's, an, it's an incredible sight to see. Uh, you can see it visually, but it's also really cool to look at it with binoculars so that you can see how the uh, starscape sort of drops off as you hit the, the cloud and, as you, and it resumes as you move away. And these clouds are only about 300 light years away. And if you look at any picture of a remote galaxy, you'll see dust lanes in those remote galaxies. This is exactly the same thing we're seeing on a grand scale because we're looking at the Milky Way from inside uh, one of these uh, dust lanes. So that's a, that's a really cool nearby feature of the Milky Way. Um, the another uh, feature here is uh, the Sagittarius star cloud. Now the Sagittarius star cloud is right up here. It's this brightening here. So these are the dark clouds I was just showing you uh, before, and there's a brightening here. Can everybody see that there? And that is a cool uh, spot, and essentially this is a porthole through those dust clouds that allows us to look towards the center of the galaxy. If you're looking at that with binoculars, you actually have almost a thousand stars that you can see with a pair of binoculars in just that small spot of the sky. And uh, you are looking, some of the stars that are in that porthole are up to 10,000 light years away. So this is the actual uh, from an astronomer's perspective, this was extremely important to discover because this is one of the few places where we can actually see towards the other side of the galaxy. Because everywhere else you look, there's dust and gas and other stuff that gets in the way. So we have to use radio astronomy and indirect techniques to find out what we can see. But there, in that Sagittarius star cloud, we're able to see through the Milky Way towards the other side. Yeah. The open house was talking about all of those uh, spots, as it were, the Omega and the Stellar Clouds. And yeah. So, yeah, and these are all... And where he was looking at them. That's right, and these are all the highlights of the summer season, really. Um, so the Trifid Nebula, M20, the Lagoon Nebula, M8, which looks great, and it's known as sort of the, uh, the bit of steam that comes off of the uh, teapot asterism here. Uh, the Omega Nebula M17 and the Eagle Nebula M16, which is uh, famous, and we and so so this is uh, essentially you know again looking at uh, the Milky Way as a as a target. Um, in terms of some of the deep sky, I, I, I didn't note these two here, but these. See if I can go back. Can I go back? Yes, I can. Look at that. Uh, M M6 and M7. They're a couple of my favorites, and they're located down here towards the the right of the teapot. And they're beautiful open clusters that you can see that are, that are only visible at this time of year. And as soon as Sagittarius starts to dip down, those, those uh, uh, clusters disappear as well. Uh-oh. 
Thank you. Um, also, globular clusters, M13, uh, M unknown, M22, and Sagittarius, all great uh, options. And I can see it try again. Here we go. Whoops. Uh, nope. Oh. Next. One more. Okay. So the project for this month uh, is Eclipse Pictures. So I would encourage everyone to try and take some, some informal pictures of your Eclipse, get your own. Um, there's kind of two different ways one can do this. One is to sort of do it with a, a real kind of quote-unquote uh, serious camera, and there's lots of great websites that have options on that. And there was a great article in the last month's issue of Sky News which talked about how to go about taking some Eclipse pictures to get yourself some souvenir photos. Um, there's a couple of other websites here, I'll mention those. Um, the other option is a smartphone Eclipse picture, and this is kind of like a little bit more subtle. You can't obviously point a smartphone at the sun and expect to get a good picture because that'll just probably ruin your camera. But there's lots of things one can take pictures of during a, an eclipse and a partial eclipse even like the one we have here in Toronto. So certainly the light and the, uh, the shade of, on the ground is going to change when we get to a 70% totality and your camera will pick that up better then you may be able to see it with your own eyes. So you can take pictures of, of it, the area around you before, during, and after, and get yourself some nice comparisons there. Sometimes you'll also get some interesting pictures by picking pictures of yourself and looking behind you and seeing shadows and patterns. One of the things that um, I think an Eclipse people will know better is that we may see uh, images of the sun projected by trees through the, through the leaves. Um, and again, that makes a great picture. So if you if you look under, under a tree, you'll see lots of tiny little suns, and you can take pictures of that. Um, you can also make a pinhole projection system by taking um, taking a, a pin and dropping it into a box and projecting that and get an image of the sun. And you can take easily take a picture of that with your uh, your camera. Uh, turning off your flash very important, and obviously uh, you can take a, a number of pictures. The event will take about uh, an hour and a half or so to uh, go from end to end. People here know the number better than me. Three? Three hours altogether. Uh, the, the core part of it is about 45 minutes when the sun is mostly obscured and you can have time to do some of these things, even if you're not actually in the path of totality. And then the other thing which uh, Ian was mentioning too is that um, if you're able to and you're in town, I really encourage you to get out there and share the view. These are just the events that are listed on our website, and I think Ralph will probably talk a bit more about them. And even if you don't, it, you know, you're not able to get off work, if you bring one of those eclipse glasses with you to work, say, why don't we all go out at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, let's have a quick look at this eclipse, and share the view with, uh, with your friends and colleagues. So I think that's a, a great opportunity. And that's it for the sky this month for me. Any questions or other contributions? Anything I missed? Once. Oh, at the back. Yes, sir. I, I just made that. Uh, NASA has a great site of the Eclipse. A lot of information there. And uh, one of the web pages has all kinds of activities. Right. Uh, for the school kids or for adults. Uh, and there's lots of little downloads if you want to download anything about Eclipse and have a poster or something. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really worthwhile to spend some time beforehand to, to research some of those activities and take advantage of it. It should be a, it should be a national holiday, really, uh, but <laughs> not yet. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Tony. Yeah, another trick uh, you were mentioning about how to project the sun so you can see nice crescents on the ground to take pictures of. Another trick that can be done is to take uh, the strainer colander from your kitchen. Oh, <laughs> the yeah. Round holes. Right. Project... Uh, Hundreds of crescents on the ground through the sun, pass it through it. Neat. I got a pegboard. I got a piece of pegboard. The same thing. I got a pegboard. I would remember pegboard. Okay, I'm going to remember that one. That's a good one. Excellent. What board was that? Pegboard. Lots of pegboard. You know the little ones with the little holes. Okay. Going once. Going twice. All right. Oh, one more. Yeah. Um, if, if people want, there's a, a free app for Android or iOS. Uh, Eclipse Safari mm -hmm. from the people who make Sky Safari. Right. So that's free. You can download it. It has lots of links to information, uh, and you can also uh, 
see the exact particulars for the clips in your location right. and, and play that to see how it progresses. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it's very useful, especially if you're thinking of taking pictures of any kind, yeah. The Exploratorium has stuff and there are things online so you can watch the eclipse at different points across the U.S. at different times during the day so you can see it <laughs> it's true. on the West Coast and see it on the East Coast because NASA's got people in different sites right across the states. I think, I think one last thing I'll say about the eclipse. I think this will be probably the best photographed eclipse of all time. And I do think that one of the things I'm kind of looking forward to seeing is that they're planning to make sort of an interactive movie of the entire event so that you'll actually have like a, you know, a 30 minute um, uh, exposure showing the entire eclipse from end to end, which is being recorded by multiple cameras at multiple locations using the same equipment. And so you'll have uh, some, after this eclipse, I think we're going to have some awesome pictures to, to share and to spend some time looking at. So I think it'll be great. Light during an eclipse. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's definitely that going on for sure too. I heard NASA's, they have like a supersonic jet that they're going to try and stay in the shadow. Okay. <laughs> they're apparently going to, they're apparently going to try and stay in the shadow for up to seven minutes. <laughs> That's great. Okay, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. And our speaker, Ron McDonald, is here already. So, any help? One, one second. Ron, I just got to load up. Hang on one second. You know, this isn't part of my, my talk, but I remember the incredible excitement of the moon landings. And my recollection, this is the most publicized astronomical event since Neil landed. Maybe people would disagree, but there's really, it's just amazing the press coverage that is already there and we have another few weeks to go. So, so uh, there. So when may I start? Everything's okay? How Ancients Predicted Eclipses, and um, I made a mistake in the title, but I'll get to that in a little later. Um, oh. Um, early religions, you had priests, shamans, astrologers, whatever you call them, that came up with supernatural explanations for uh, how life existed and also giving them an easier life than working in fields for 14 hours. And often the supernatural beings were astronomical objects like the sun or the moon. Can you imagine the effect of an eclipse? If the sun turned dark, disappeared over a land, would that mean that the gods are angry with the king? I have a couple of things to mention. Um, a king in uh, the emperor of China, uh, his uh, astrologers did not predict the eclipse, and he executed them, not doing a good job. Um, there was a, I, I read about a man that visited Yucatan and was staying with a family uh, that were of Mayan descent. And they'd probably been Christian for maybe 30 generations since the Spanish invaded. And the lady, uh, the mother was a science teacher, went to university, took all the courses, and during a lunar, not a solar, but a lunar eclipse, she was in rank terror. These are really serious events. Okay, I'm going to bounce back and forth between history and uh, uh, modern interpretations. Uh, this is the orbit of the moon, and on August 21st, um, the moon is going to be very close to Regulus. Um, as we, uh, as the Earth goes around the sun, around September 17th, not this diagram, but a little further, the moon is also pointing to Regulus. So the period compared to the stars is 27.3 days, but it takes another two days for the Earth to go far enough that the moon is new again. Now, the key to understanding eclipses is the tilt of the orbit. And it's tilted by uh, five degrees. 
And in my diagram, this is trying to show the part of the moon that is below from the northern perspective, the ecliptic or the plane of the sun. And this is the part where it's above. And if it turns out that um, there's a certain spot where the moon crosses the ecliptic, and this is what's called the line of nodes because it's crossing the ecliptic here and here. So eclipses only occur when the new and full moons are close to the nodes. And three lunar cycles later, you've now got a situation where when you have a new moon that's close to the sun, it's well below, i.e. south of the sun, and the, the, uh, that's a new moon, and the full moon is way above, so you don't get any eclipses here. But six lunar cycles later, you get now a case where the line of nodes roughly points towards the sun, and in every you have eclipse season again, and for every eclipse season you have at least one lunar and one solar eclipse somewhere, and sometimes two. Now, 12 lunar cycles is going to be uh, 354 days, so the new moon comes a little early in our calendar every year, and that's one reason why one year it's fairly good to watch the Perseids, the following year it's 11 days different in cycle, and it's probably going to interfere. Now this I find staggering. This is the modern value for the average new new duration, from new moon to new moon. The Babylonian value is less than a second difference. And this is 500 BC. It's one part in 5 million accuracy. I doubt if there's anything that was that accurately measured back then. Um, just amazing. Now, here we have a, a, a path of the lunar cycles going around. And of course, it's not that the Earth stops here and then the moon goes around it and then it hops to there. It's just a continual thing. And the moon just waves a little bit. It doesn't ever go backwards. Now, if the moon were only affected by the Earth's gravity, what you would have is every year in August, i.e., this is uh, cycle zero, you would have an eclipse towards Leo, and six months later, you would have an eclipse towards uh, Capricorn. The only problem is the sun's gravity tugs the moon so it bends a little bit each time, and these angles are actually accurate. And it turns out that uh, it bends a little bit, 19 degrees, and uh, you get an eclipse season every 5.8 lunar cycles. A similar thing happens with the perigees and apogees. Last February, there was an annular eclipse uh, over Argentina, and that means the moon was further away from the Earth than normal. And for August, it's going to be closer than normal, which gives us a, uh, a total solar eclipse. Of course, my diagram is exaggerated. Counting the sun, you now get these things bent. Now, here's the amazing thing to me. Two to 3,000 years ago, the Babylonians knew that. How did they know it? They had a systematic way of keeping track of astronomical events. And they were on cuneiform or clay uh, records, and some of those have been lost, and some of them haven't been translated, but a number have been looked at. Now, what do these things record? The dates of events like comets, the first morning sighting of Sirius, and that's important because it makes sure the calendar keeps locked into the real cycle of the Earth. Uh, planet locations, eclipses, but there's also a systematic record of the lunar positions. There are lunar six events and the date and time of each is recorded. Now, this picture shows the first crescent moon, and that's Jupiter, by the way, by accident. I didn't realize it was there. Um, there are four involving the full moon, and they're a little complicated, but the, the last moonrise before sunset is one of the events. So they recorded the date and time in each. They also recorded the lunar latitude. So these people knew the stars, and they could look at the moon, and they could see the stars, and they could say, this is a little above or a little below the normal position of the moon, and they could get the lunar latitude. Um, one thing that amazed me, and actually I emailed somebody, is they didn't record the azimuth events. It would be very easy to have one observing place and to have markers like Stonehenge where this is north, etc., etc., and they could have got an estimate of where these events happened, but uh, uh, they didn't do that. They use water clocks. I couldn't find a uh, Babylonian water clock pictures, but they're not very accurate. The water viscosity doubles over 30 degrees C, but they got the times. They found patterns in the data. And 
One of the patterns is 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours, and it was called a seros, that I gather means 360. I'm not quite sure how that happens. So the Babylonians could say eclipse season is usually six or five uh, lunar cycles apart. But observers at one place cannot see all the eclipses. Sometimes they happen the other side of the Earth. Sometimes they're low magnitude where 10% of the sun is being blocked. That's hard to see. Sometimes, of course, you have lousy weather. A lunar eclipse, you can see about half of the Earth can see it. But a solar eclipse, the um, maybe a quarter of the Earth can see part of it. And I worked out the length of the path times 100 kilometers. And it's about 0.3% of the Earth's surface, which is about one every 330 years to repeat. And I think it's a little more than that, but it's in the, the right ballpark. Now, here are the numbers of the moon's orbit. And you have four periods, the sidereal is compared to the stars when it goes past Leo again. The new node duration is the longest. The node node, that's where the nodes are turning and it's a different number. And the perigee perigee duration is a different number. Now the Cyril's explanation is that 223 new new cycles is this number of days. A slightly large number of node node cycles, remember how the sun turned the node slowly around, is almost the same time, only 52 minutes longer. And the perigee cycle is a little bit longer, but it's roughly the same. So that means if you have an eclipse and another one is going to happen this time later, and it's going to be roughly the same node position and the same position of being uh, close to the sun or far away. So my only solar eclipse was in about there in Turkey. It was really rough. We had to climb a 400-foot castle, and we saw the shadow of the moon descending the Tigris Valley. I don't think Nebraska will quite uh, uh, get the same thing, but hopefully not. Now, the next one is going to be this number of days plus a third of a day. And a third of the day, the Earth rotates to there. So my only other eclipse and this one are part of the same sero cycle. And another that number of days, you're going to have a comparable eclipse with two and a half odd minutes of totality over China. But wait a minute, three of those is going to be roughly a whole number. And it's only going to be 52 minutes short. And it turns out there was an eclipse in 1963 that was a little further north than this one. And the period of the 54-year, 34-day cycle is Cox, I don't know how you pronounce it, ex -ligmos. And Ralph, I think that was when you first got interested in astronomy, seeing that eclipse, right? And you're going to be one of a very small group of people, if it's clear in Salem, to see a second eclipse in the same ex -ligmos. And I don't know whether it's going to be 50 people, 1,000 people that have done that, but it's a pretty small number of people that have seen that. So this is the Babylonians. They found the cycle of five or six lunar cycle patterns near the full and the new moon. They found the Seros pattern, the 223. They found the 53-year cycle, not sure how much they used to predict, but they didn't make many mathematical models. So they have a rough idea there's going to be a lunar eclipse, not such a rough idea of a solar eclipse. So did those ancients predict eclipses? Maybe. Now we get to the Greeks. Um, Alexander the Great conquered Babylon, so they got all the Babylonian records. They made mathematical models using geometry and trig, and they're two giants of Greek astronomy. Hipparchos lived uh, 190 to 120 BCE. Is that okay? It's an acronym. Okay. And Ptolemy lived uh, 300 years later uh, after Christ. So Hipparchos' books have been all, almost all lost. Uh, Ptolemy referred to Hipparchos' books, and it's a question whether... Ptolemy's ideas are his alone, or whether he just copied Hipparchos. And uh, years later, some Muslim scholars went to the emperor in Constantinople and said, can we copy this book? 
and they translated it into Arabic. All of the Greek versions of the book were lost, so it was translated to Arabic. So you have an interesting translation process. It went from Greek to 300 year later Greek, to Arabic, to Latin, and then to English. So it's interesting how these uh, things uh, spread around. Greeks worked under two assumptions. First is that the earth is the center of everything and everything revolves around us. So you have different spheres with the moon on it, the Venus, the sun, Mars, the distant stars, other planets, everything uh, orbits around the earth. The second one that makes less sense to me is you have uniform circular motion. So the sun moves, this time counterclockwise, because it's from the perspective of the earth, it moves uh, evenly compared to the center of movement. This was their assumption. But you can make an equatorial ring, this one's in Canberra, and an equatorial ring, this points exactly to the celestial pole, this one points exactly where the celestial equator is. And on the equinox date, you have the sun being on one side, so you get a slight reflection here, there. Then you have just a complete shadow. Then you have the reflection on the other side. You can get the time of equinox within a few hours of this. And solstice can be found by just the shadows and the shortest day. Oops, wrong button. So these are modern values for season lengths. And obviously, it can't be even circulation because the summer is longer than the northern winter. Solution? Then you have the Earth that is the center of everything, but the sun orbits somewhere or, or moves compared to a different spot than the Earth. And it turns out mathematically, knowing the number of days from each season, and these are the, uh, wait a minute, this would be the solstice times and this would be the equinox times. Um, you can work out where this sun is compared to the Earth as a percentage of the sun's orbit, and you can work out the angle between there and there. So, I always thought these were just pretty diagrams, but they're more than that. 61 days after the equinox, the sun will have moved 60 divide, uh, 61 divided by the number of days of the year, which is 60.12 degrees. You know that angle. We also know that angle from a previous calculation, and I just measured this in the diagram, but you can calculate how far the sun has moved compared to the spring equinox to where it is. You can predict where the sun's gonna be at any given time. What about the moon? Moon's more complicated, it's tilted. And, oh, I forgot the sheet. This is part of the Almagest, and it's a diagram, and I still can't figure it out. This is the Earth. <laughs> something is moving at a constant rate around the Earth, connected to something that goes to this spot, and then the Moon goes in a constant rate compared to that spot. And by working out where the Sun or where the Moon is at different times of the lunar cycle, you can work out the different values of those parameters. And using calculation, you can work out where the Moon is going to be at any given spot. Now you're predicting locations. What's the accuracy of Ptolemy's model? About a degree and a half of longitude, which is three hours of the motion of the sun. Hmm. Anybody heard of Christopher Columbus? His fourth mission, he traveled all around and he suddenly found his boat was getting eaten away by worms. And he didn't think he was seaworthy, so he went into a bay in Jamaica and sent some sailors in a rowboat to Santa Domingo to get rescued. The governor was rather slow to rescue him, <clears throat> so um, he originally got food from the Arawak Indians, but eventually they said, uh, we're not happy to feed you anymore, and it was a conflict. But the lunar, the uh, almanac, the, the uh, almanac that w people used to uh, navigate said there's going to be a lunar eclipse on leap year day 1504. So he called the Indians to a meeting on that day. And it was supposed to, the eclipse was actually supposed to start um, a little after sunset. The problem is when the Indians were there and the sunset, he realized that the moon was already being eclipsed. So it was wrong by a few hours. But he told them that I made the moon go away because the gods are angry because you're not feeding us and you have to feed us. 
and I'm going to go in the tent and talk to God. And he went into a tent, and he had an hourglass to time how long the eclipse was going to be. And then he came back out. This is according to his, his um, uh, um, uh, diary. He came back out, and um, the uh, Indians, uh, he said, uh, if you promise to feed us, we'll make the moon come back. And, of course, the moon came back, which is what of anyway. And, um, uh, but that illustrates the inaccuracy of this model. So... Ptolemaic astronomy, it was authority for about one and a half millennia, and it was approximate predictions, but it was limited accuracy, especially for solar eclipses. So, did the Greeks predict eclipses? Maybe. Then came an amazing period of history called the Renaissance. Copernicus, planets move around the sun. Galileo, moons orbit Jupiter. Kepler, my hero, ditched the uniform circle idea. And David is symbol of an explosion of art. Michelangelo, Shakespeare, um, Leonardo, just an incredible era of history. Kepler, by using data that he stole from Tycho Brahe uh, of lunar, of uh, Martian positions, was able to figure out that objects in orbit go in an ellipse, not a circle. And ellipses were well known at that time. And... Um, uh, lots of people knew about them. His second law in some way is more important because this showed uh, in uh, this planet moving here would sweep a certain area in 30 days. And he was able to show that when it's closer, it's going to sweep the same area. And once they figured calculus to work these things out, you could predict where a planet is going to be at any spot of its orbit with much better accuracy than before. And of course, Newton, Euler, Halley, Meyer, Bessel, all sorts of people contributed things. And they figured out the three-body problem where you have these other effects. And only then did you get the first eclipse map. Now, if you have a November 2012 Sky and Tell, or if you can remember eclipsemaps.com, there's an amazing story in these maps. What this guy, Vigil, is the first guy to do it, and he predicted this eclipse on what's the 2nd of August, 1654. It's going to, the path of totality is going to go here, and that's the last, the first time anybody predicted the path of totality, and he said the greatest eclipse would be in the Crimea. Now, what's needed to figure out exactly where an eclipse is going to be? You need to know the exact moment of the new moon so you can figure out where on the spinning earth the greatest eclipse is going to be. You need to know the time between the new moon and the node crossing. Remember, it's going either up or down compared to north. And that tells you whether it's going to be an eclipse in the southern hemisphere or the northern hemisphere. And the other thing you need for this is accurate earth maps. You could work out the longitude and latitude of where it's going to be, but look at how inaccurate the map of Africa is, right? So these things were a work in progress, and they got improved. Now, eclipse chasing. Lots of people to uh, chase eclipses, including someone with, a license, with that on his license plate. Um, <laughs> let's say the richest person in the world, maybe the king of Spain, wanted to see this eclipse. So he gets a telephone call from Weigel. <laughs> oh, they weren't invented yet, that the eclipse is going to be in Crimea. Then he orders the Royal Air Force to fire up the Royal Jet, <laughs> fly to Crimea International Airport, land, park at the best spot, and he would have missed totality because the mathematics wasn't there yet to be exact. So eclipse chasing is a recent phenomenon and um, that's where we have it. Now, there are all sorts of examples in literature, King Solomon's Mines, Connecticut Yankee, Yankee, where people did what Columbus did and threatened, and it's easy to write that in a story. Uh, the logistics is these explorers, uh, I think they're grave robbers actually is a better description. Um, they would have to know exactly where they were on the earth to be able to predict that, and uh, I doubt if they had the uh, navigation equipment. Okay, here's an eclipse map that we've all seen. I'm going to be in Nebraska with Dennis Gray and a whole bunch of other people. 
This is a close up and it shows, this is the center line, but when you're three quarters of the way to the outside, you still get two minutes instead of two minutes and 30 seconds. So you don't have to be right on the center line. Next picture shows a little town. Uh, we're going to be at the KOA here, but Minden. And I'm going to end with a picture of Minden. This is from Google Maps. And there's a house here, but I couldn't get the same picture by going further back. And let's say I'm driving near Minden and see the water tower here on the highest hill of town. And let's say I'm driving along here and I see some kids playing. So I roll down the window and I say, are you going to watch the eclipse on Monday? Oh yeah, we're looking forward to it. And let's say they, t and, and then I asked them, well, where you can observe it from? And they could say, oh, from my, uh, the yard. And I could tell them, you know what? The difference between an almost eclipse and a complete eclipse is staggering. And if you go to the parking lot there, you can see a total eclipse. You probably won't see it from here. And that says something about the state of modern astronomical understanding that I find terribly profound. It's a result of 3,000 years of observations, math, discoveries, and I take my hat off to the people that have done that. Thank you very much, and I'd love to have some questions if you have any. Should I have called it how the ancients predicted eclipses? Or should I have called it how the ancients didn't predict eclipses? Because, what's that? Almost. Yeah. They, they weren't bad on, on, on lunar eclipses. Anyway, are there any uh, questions? I threw a lot at you, but it's really fascinating. Yes? What about other, other cultures, like the Mayans or Chinese? Uh, okay. Um, the Mayans... Um, they had a major library where they kept all their astronomical records and some Spanish general came there with soldiers, put everything outside and burned all the records. There are a few that were kept and I can go forward here to it. Oops, there. Oh, how can I go back? I thought, can you take me to the last uh, slide? I went one too far. Um, there is one record that was taken before this fire happened, and um, uh, it has the number 223 in it, which means they figured out the Saros pattern from thousands of years of observations. Uh, Chinese, um, I'm not aware that they worked out the elliptical uh, 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 path of the orbits, which is key to working out where the moon's going to be at a given time. Um, uh, but there were major treatments of eclipses there as well. Um, I actually got a whole bunch of material on Chinese eclipses, but I didn't get a chance to read it uh, because I was focusing on the rest. There's only so much I could include, but there were discoveries. But to me, the key is what Kepler did. You know, elliptical patterns, it explains the orbits and everything. Okay. Uh, and I, was there another question up there? Yeah. What about India? What's that? Uh, yeah. oh. All right. Um, he, he mentioned those two cultures. Um, the Almagest that Ptolemy wrote, maybe I should stay here. The Almagest that Ptolemy wrote was translated into Arabic. It was also used by Indian astronomers. I don't know if they translated it to Sanskrit or whatever the dominant language would have been then. <clears throat> there were all sorts of advancements of slightly better epicycles and everything else. But again, I haven't read anything that indicates they figured out orbits are ellipses and everything that is really needed to predict solar eclipses. Lunar eclipses, they could predict fairly well, but solar eclipses, um, <clears throat> to say there's going to be an eclipse on this day at this place, um, my reading says not. But again, I, I didn't, uh, I only had so long to talk, so I didn't uh, go into that in the depth. Uh, uh, this continental Indians, not not. What's that? Uh, we're talking about, I think the gentleman was talking, asking you about subcontinent India rather yeah. than Indians in America. No, no, no. I, I was thinking of the the, the Almagest. I, I don't think the Almagest was sent to North America. You know, uh, like I was thinking that it, it traveled from Islamic countries through to, uh, to India and was used by astronomers there. Yeah, that's what I was referring to.
I put, is there another? Are, do you have a question then? Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? No. Okay. I'm toned down. I'm, I'm used to speaking without a microphone to uh, big lecture halls, and my voice does carry. <clears throat> Uh, you need to make that a uh, single page. There we go. Yeah. And that looks like it's Control L, so that's fine. Can I have the, the other? This one? Yeah. I need to synchronize it to you. At first, I thought Ralph was going to introduce me, and um, we've known each other uh, too long. <laughs> And uh, so, yes, yeah, we've, we've only known each other for like seven years, that's right. Um, okay, so thank you for uh, allowing me to, or letting me fill this extra space you have. Um, you can see the title. I don't need to go into that uh, too much. Um, I've been to Antarctica three times. Uh, the last time was 2006, 2007 to work on these things. And let's give you a better. Uh, okay. I think I pressed the wrong button, obviously. Uh, okay, let me try that. There. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. There. Let's get rid of the titles. So you can see these things better. Um, they. Um, these things are what we're studying, polygonal patterned ground. These ones are young, and these ones are more older and more developed. And we'll go into that in more detail. But what's really cool, next. <laughs> oh, okay. So now, okay. Um, is that the ones on Mars look exactly the same. And when the the Phoenix lander, we've lost some of the caption there. There we go. Um, so when I and my students and uh, all of us involved in this project saw these pictures, we went, wow, look at that. And all of our housemates went, uh, okay. <laughs> so um, now let me see if I can get this to work. Ah, okay. Now, this talk I'm giving you is actually based on a talk that my student gave at a conference on ground penetrating radar, um, but I've embellished it for this audience. Um, there's the group of us. So, um, the uh, my master's student, uh, Mavanwi Godfrey, uh, did her master's. Last I heard, she was superintendent of mines in Queensland. Uh, that's me, of course. Uh, John Lapwood did his honors dissertation with me the year before and then came along as a field assistant uh, before he went off to work in the mines in Western Australia. And then this is Michelle Bannister, who did her honors project that year in geology and astronomy on the dry valleys as an analog for Mars. And some of you may be aware of her and the work she's doing. She did her PhD at ANU looking for exoplanets, and she's now a research associate at Queen's University Belfast 
and you will have seen her name in the news looking for planet X out beyond Pluto, and also that enigmatic object out there that seems to be orbiting the wrong way. So she's been doing work on that. Um, so it's kind of exciting to have seen all of where all of my students have ended up. Uh, there's just some, K054 is the designation for the project, and that's a unique designator. And if ever I get the chance to, if I ever, someone is willing to take my eye teeth and send me back to Antarctica, that will be the number we use. Um, this is just a list of what we're going to do. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to give you the, the introduction, why we did it, how we did it, what we found, and what we can conclude, the usual sort of strategy. And what we're looking at is permafrost. And so basically, it's the zone here of permanent fro the, the ground being permanently frozen. So there's an active layer up here that goes frozen in winter, thawed in summer, and there's especially a thin layer in here of water that is particularly forms and dissolves ions in the ground, and that will become important. So what happens is we initially, the young ones, you get this, it freezes, and of course, ice expands, and you get the cracks opening up, and various material falls in, and then the crack can't close, so it opens further. And so these cracks grow with time. So you get the, by the 500th freeze-thaw, you've got quite a big crack, and you notice that because the ice can't fill, it deforms. And so you get this wonderful deformation in the cracks and in the subsurface and in the active layer. And so these were our targets using the geophysical, um, the non-invasive, non-destructive near-surface geophysical imaging. So that was the whole idea of the project, was to use these geophysical methods that's what I am, I'm a geophysicist, to look at this. And we also wanted to see if we could see anything in the course of even just one thaw. Because how long these dry valleys have been ice-free is controversial. So that's where we're working. Um, you know that most maps uh, north is up. Well, this isn't one of those maps. Um, north is up everywhere. Okay, so there's the South Pole, so there's North, there's North, there's North, there's North, there's North. Um, okay, so here's McMurdo Sound, um, and the Ross Sea is, uh, so McMurdo Sound is right in here, Ross um, Island is in there, New Zealand's down there somewhere, uh, Chile and Argentina, South America is there, uh, South Africa's over there somewhere, Australia's over here somewhere. And so that's where we're working and so here's, um, get to find the button again. So there's Ross Island and Trans Antarctic Mountains. And so these areas in here are where we have the dry valleys. Now, Antarctica is 98% ice covered, but 95% of the ice free area is right in here. And it's been ice free for a long time. I'm not quite sure how long. And, there's, and as I said, there's some controversy. So, one of the sites we went to was Victoria Valley here, and then Beacon Valley here. So I'll show you each of them in turn. So here's Victoria Valley. And uh, so that's sort of the views from Victoria Valley. You'll see, I'll show you some more of these later. And so we leave Scott Base. So here's Scott Base, uh, Mount Erebus, active volcano in, uh, in Antarctica. Um, Often we'd see there, and there appear to be cloud there, but actually it was steam uh, and ash. Um, the tacky flag, the t-shirt I'm wearing, that's the Scott Base Bar, or at least that was the name, and it's basically at this corner, I think it's this corner right here, it might be this corner right here, um, having a nice view out across uh, Ross Sea. And we take off from the helicopter pad with all of our stuff, we fly out across the Ross Ice Shelf, and into the Transantarctic Mountains. It's a spectacular view. Um, this is me, my view from the uh, front seat. Being the team leader, I said, I claim that front seat uh, beside the pilot. Um, 
the scenery is spectacular. It's one of the, Antarctica is amazingly fragile environmentally, but also phenomenally harsh. If you make a mistake in Antarctica, you could be dead. So it's both harsh and unforgiving and yet very fragile. And we finally get into the dry valleys and you know, it's hard to tell one dry valley from another unless you know the lakes and the, and the glaciers and so on. So here we are back at our site and notice the polygons are everywhere, okay? So this is characteristic of polar regions, especially, you know, Antarctica, we see them in the Arctic, we see them in high alpine areas. Anywhere you have permafrost, you get the polygonal pattern to ground. And there's move on we again. So the, we unload, we set up, um, yeah, when, the coming down on coming down on the plane with the Air National Guard, one of the guys, um, you know, these are part timers, you know, they they go out periodically with them. He had his own real estate agency. The sign was up in the plane. I said, uh, "Would you like us to uh, put this up at our camp?" He says, "Yeah," and then send me a picture. So, um, but this was our our home tent. So this is where we would eat, relax, and so on. Um, so here's our camp. Relatively con contained, um, not spread out, a small footprint. In fact, the NSF people came out to look at our operation. Um, we became the model of the operation, largely due to Mavanwi's organizational skills. So um, these are our tents here and our home tent. And that's another view of it. That's a bit distorted. It's actually the distance here is a little bit further. I think I use a telephoto lens. And so uh, that previous shot looking out across the valley was taken from up here. Um, this was the view up the valley towards this the Victoria Glacier and the Antarctic ice shelf up here flowing down. This is the view out my tent in the morning. Um, out one view and out the other. Um, as I said, it's, you know, harshly beautiful. Um, it's, there are people, pe two kinds of people go to Antarctica. Those who go once say, oh, okay, I've done that. Actually, there are three kinds. There are those, uh, I don't want to go. Those who go once and say, I've done that. And then there are those of us who go and it gets in the blood. And we go again and again and again. Um, so we hiked up to that glacier. It's about two hours. We took one day and just took a day off and hiked up there. And, that's 50 to 100 meters tall. Yeah, it, we, you don't go very close because the ice front is always collapsing. You don't want to have any kinds of injuries. So again, that's the view. This is looking, there's our camp right there. Let's zoom in on that. So looking out across the valley. So there's our camp. And so we placed it and we then did all of our experience right close by. So there's the camp. And so there are polygons. That's the young polygons. Those are the young polygons. That's the older polygon. So these, the, this isn't very far, you know, tens of meters in each direction. And then um, Michelle did a big transect across the entire valley using uh, deep imaging techniques. And there's Mavanwi standing uh, by polygon set one. Uh, we didn't, we, we took, um, the sets um, in here, uh, these four here, we didn't go to this one because that's Sammy the seal there. Um, yeah, he wasn't in terribly good condition when we saw him. Um, he, you know, various animals get into like penguins, seals, they get in there and there's no food. There's no water really. Um, and they die and because of the setting, they just become mummified. Um, we did have creature comforts, you know, I, there I am with my, the lawn chair, my coffee in the morning. Um, we had Christmas down there and it was a dry camp, not in terms of alcohol. <laughs> yeah. Water was only for drinking. We had a case of that horrible alcohol based stuff that you use for the disinfectant that that's all we had for washing. <clears throat> so, 
So we had lot, we had beer, we had wine, and so on. Anyway, the storms come in occasionally. Here are the clouds spilling over from the Antarctic uh, shelf, and here's the clouds coming out from the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, from Ross Sea. And of course, those days you don't go out because if you get too far from camp, you might not be able to find your way back. Um, and here I am, uh, wandering up the hill, uh, and one of these storms is starting to roll in. I took a picture and I went back to camp. But you can see it, it did get cold, unlike the picture where I was having my coffee. There were days when we worked in t-shirts. Uh, this was not one of those days. Okay, the other one, Beacon Valley, um, down here. So Victoria Valley, we thought, you know, it's been ice-free for, say, hundreds of 100,000 years, maybe, maybe a bit more. Some people think that uh, Beacon Valley has been ice-free for millions of years. Maybe a million years, but some people think eight million years because they date the rocks on the surface, and they get eight million years. But when you see our results, when you see our results, um, it sort of brings that into question because we can see active processes underneath, which suggests that that may not be the case. So we, when we, this is a trip we took to scout out um, the next site from Victoria Valley to Beacon Valley, going across the Transantarctic Mountains. Again, spectacular scenery. You can see, though, the low cloud level, which is, um, you know, that meant that weather was coming in, so we ha didn't have very long. But again, spectacular scenery, uh, spectacular exposures. Um, and here's Beacon Valley, the first view of Beacon Valley. And we can see, again, from the air especially, we see the polygons everywhere. And these ones are rather better developed. Um, so it's very rocky, but here, again, you can see the clouds moving in. So we only had maybe a couple of hours there and we had to get out. Otherwise, we were going to be trapped there. Okay, so what we did was we looked at a whole different set, poly, number of polygon sets. So we classified them into four different kinds. Low relief, so that was polygon set one. We didn't even bother measuring the topography. You know, it's, it's the sort of thing you can barely measure. Now, here's the typical surface here. You can see there, there's the area there, and here's the trace of the polygons. So it's very low relief. That was the first set of polygons. That was the ones uh, near the camp, polygon set one. Then this was near the camp in Victoria Valley, polygon set two. Moderate to low relief, you know, about half a meter. And this is sort of typical surface. And this is the classic shape, so it's got here are the cracks that are infilled. Here's a ridge that builds up because of the deformation of ice adjacent to those cracks, and you have a central hollow. Then Beacon Valley, the first one, that's moderate to high relief, so upwards of half a meter to a meter. You can see it's you know, rather deeper cracks, the higher ridge, and then this central hollow is a bit smaller, but it's always there. And then finally, uh, Beacon Valley 2, high relief, one to two meters. Here's, here they're trying to do the radar survey um, stepping up. And you can see it's a little more difficult, a little more challenging. Now, I wasn't here in Beacon Valley. I'd managed to do my knee in Victoria Valley. So when we changed camps, they took me out with the rubbish. <laughs> um, so my students, though, being very well organized, um, they were able to carry on without me and actually and do a very good job. So we did a whole number of things. So we did um, radar imaging, um, 100 and 200 megahertz. I'll talk about that in a minute. And line spacing, very tight line spacing so that everything overlapped. We got nice 3D images. We got uh, surveys that gave us the velocities. And we did time lapse surveys in, in Victoria Valley. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so here's an example of the surveying. Uh, we always all took turns moving the antennas, uh, took turns look, monitoring the 
laptop. So what we do is we send out a signal. And so we have this antenna, it sends out a shaped pulse. Some of it travels through the air, that's the fastest. Some of it travels through the ground. And so the air wave provides a time reference, the ground wave provides a depth reference. So some of the, most of the, ener the, the energy travels mostly into the ground. We get reflections from boundaries and from anomalies. And those reflections then return to the receiver and we record it on our laptop. And this is another way of looking at it. So here's our air wave at 300 meters per microsecond. The direct wave about 100 to 100, 150 meters per microsecond. And then we have reflective boundaries below, which will have different velocities, depending on the content. And so we've got a wiggle trace. So we've got this pulse we send out and we get the air wave as our time reference, the ground wave as the depth reference, and then any reflections from the subsurface that tell us what's there. Um, now, what's interesting is that there's this wonderful relationship between velocity and wavelength and frequency. Velocity equals wavelength times frequency. That's true for all waves. And so the wavelength is the velocity divided by the frequency, and the resolution at the surface is one quarter wavelength. It increases, that, that increases with depth. As you get deeper, it's, the signal spreads. The, that footprint of the radar spreads out. But basically, it's about a quarter wavelength, and that governs our step size, the size of the survey. So here, that resolution is about 32, 16 centimeters, so 15 to 30 centimeters lateral resolution. So that's about our step size. That's, that would be the optimum step size, and we did less than that. 20 centimeters for the 100 megahertz, 10 centimeters for the 200 megahertz. And the vertical resolution is about a half to a third of that. So that's the kind of scale of things we're looking at. And then, ah, okay, so that, that does show up. You can, this is, I've tried to up the contrast. You can see instant gratification as we're going along, stepping along, we actually see this, the record showing up as it develops. We can step the antennas out from a central point. It's called center, center midpoint. And we can figure out the velocity of the subsurface, we also calibrate to make sure that we get the airway velocity, and it always works out so far. And so we were getting velocity of about 120 to 140 meters per microsecond. That number is wrong. That, that should actually say uh, 0.12 to 0.14 meters per nanosecond. Um, so we do, then we've got these, all these profiles massive number of profiles. So we do batch processing, we throw it into the computer, we do our topographic migrations, merge out all together, and then we apply what are called AGC and SEC gains. AGC means automatic gain control. And the gain, the amplification we apply, is inversely proportional to the strength of the signal, which means the deeper it goes, the smaller the signal, we boost it more. So it's great to look to see what we can see. It gives us everything. So here's an example from the, from the flat ones, from the polygon one, we see all of these things. And in particular, we can see the cracks. And we can see, here's the active layer, here are these different uh, beds in here that are, are slightly deformed. But notice the cracks aren't vertical. And we went, oh, that doesn't fit the model which is actually often what happens. Nature often does things like that to us. Um, and then we did the same, here's, v, here's the second one. And one thing I wanna point out, so again, these cracks aren't quite vertical, uh, but notice this, and there's not much below it, whereas over here there is, but here there's this very strong reflector here. We think that's buried mass of ice. Remnants of the last time Victoria Valley was glaciated. And I want to go back and do 3D imaging of that little bit and core it and find out how old it is. Anyone got a spare couple of hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> okay, Beacon Valley, same, same sort of thing. Now we think that there might be buried massive ice in Beacon Valley, but when, 
um, we need to do more analysis. And some of the analysis I've been doing suggests, now here, the cracks are more vertical, which is interesting. Um, and here's this one with the steep topography. And again, the cracks, well, they're not quite vertical, but they're not dipping very much. Um, and it gets quite deep. Now, we thought that there might be buried mass of ice in Beacon Valley, but in fact, when I go back and look at it and do more detailed analysis, it looks like it actually might be isolated pockets of ice in the near surface, not deep. Okay, so we can see the subsurface structure, we can see deformation, we can see the cracks, uh, we can see, we think we see buried mass of ice and the relic surfaces. What we can't resolve is the, the crack depth and whether the crack morphology is consistent with that, oh, it looks, you know, it looks pretty close. So how about the time lapse? Well, you want to be able to compare from one to the next, including changes in amplitude. So what we do with the SEC, that's spreading an exponential compensation. All it does is compensate for the geometrical spread of the signal. It's like a blowing up a balloon. The balloon blows up like this. And so the signal spreads out one over R squared. And so it, it does that, and so we can compensate for that, and also the signal can be attenuated, scattered, so we lose energy there. So we compensate for that, so that means the strength of the reflectors remains the same and consistent. So we start off, and every about every four days we did this, so here's... Um, First one, you can see here's the crack. There might be, might extend it out a bit more, but this, this is definitely highly attenuated in here. And we see these different reflectors in here, and we can see them again. But the crack, you know, it looks as if um, that zone of attenuation is expanding a bit. But these cracks, you know, they, uh, they don't look exactly the same. They start to change a little bit. Notice here with this zone of attenuation looks a bit different again. And so we did about every three to four days. And we didn't expect to see much change because it's just one thaw. And yet we actually see some significant changes just over the space of a few weeks. And if we're seeing changes in that short a time frame, what does that say about the ages of the dry valleys and how long they've been dry? Because the assumption was that if you date the stuff on the surface, that represents how long things have been going on, how long things have been ice-free. But if the deformation has been going on for a long time, hmm. It makes you wonder about that timing. In fact, the people who did the dating actually scraped away some of the material and dated the ice underneath, and they got 8 million years in Beacon Valley for the stuff on top and 100,000 years for the ice underneath. And they somehow argued away that the ice was an anomalous response, but in fact, it's probably armoring that doesn't move when the ice deforms. It just sits there. So, we've got then deformation over even, we see slight, slight changes even just over one short period. Now, part of that might be due to the changes in the active layer, with that thin layer of water dissolving ions, which tends to scatter or attenuate the radar signal a bit more than otherwise. <coughs> so we see reduction in our signal response. We see the attenuation changing, and we also see these changes in the cracks, okay, so you can see there are subtle changes in here in the morphology of these reflectors. Now, they're, they're subtle. Now, how much of that's due to the change in the active layer and how much of that's actual due to deformation? Um, the deeper you go, the less influence that active layer has, so I think it looks real. So we can see the active layer, and it's some changes there. Uh, we can see seasonal activity. Uh, we can see the re possibly release and movement of salts, the active depth layer. Um, the expansion and contraction of cracks, um, that's a little harder to pick because of that uh, changes in the attenuation. So 
one of the things we realized was that it's better to do these radar surveys early in the season because then you get better signal, less attenuation. Um, we need to do a more in the way of signal analysis, and this is something that I'm, I'm continuing to work on. Um, I'm, I don't think that the Beacon Valley is over a buried mass of ice body. Uh, we question this 8.1 million um, year surface. There are two schools of thought, of course. There's Marchant and his group, and then there's the people I work with and we think differently. Um, the active versus uh, the relict processes, things that were recording past activities. Can we re directly relate the morphology to the age of maturity? Maybe. Basically, those, the cracks are forming by sublimation, although we did see some melt during the summer season. Uh, but in particular, that one that I talked about, that uh, strong reflector, was right over top of this thing. And this is a very, very resistive body, which is indicative of unperturbed, massive ice. So that's buried massive ice. <sighs> Let's get out. I want to do 3D imaging. I want to core. Let's do it. Anyway. Uh, sort of like some of the archaeological work I've done. Oh, look, we found something. I dig it. No. Um, so, we, um, a lot of this we're doing is because Antarctica is a global barometer. Um, we can look at the coupling of the dry valleys and the processes and the climatic conditions. Uh, we can monitor the seasonal changes. And so we wanted to do a long-term seasonal monitoring, but uh, the New Zealand government decided that it was more important to invest money in the in research into southern fisheries, because that made money. Um, then into looking at paleoclimate and paleo um, um, glacial processes in Antarctica. Um, and of course, we come back to Mars and the fact that um, the PPG overprint on Mars. I mean, this stuff looks exactly like the stuff we saw in Antarctica. And that's, that's exciting. And so a lot of people have thought the same thing. And so in 2020, there will be a launch and there will be a, another Mars lander. And this time, it will have ground penetrating radar on. And I've been going to the GPR meetings now for a long time, the ground penetrating radar meetings. I've been going to them for a long time. And there have been lunar radars and Martian radars. And these have all been going on for a long time. And now, it's finally going to happen. And so here's a schematic of what it will look like, something like this with the radar here, and this is what the subsurface would look like, and this is what the radar image might show. And they've been doing some tests. So here we've got our, our prototypes, of what they call the wisdom antenna. So they've got two, a couple of different kinds of antennas. Uh, this one was from the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in 2009. So this is where the two groups you know, overlap. So here they've been doing some tests on Svalbard. Notice the date. I went looking to see what they've been doing, and hey, they're testing it just last month, just a few weeks ago. Twenty, and uh, it's kind of exciting because look at this. Now that's ice. That's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 meters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a good response. Someone in the audience went, damn. Okay. <laughs> and then there's the there's the, the rock below. Now, that's not necessarily a good test because we're not going to actually see, well, we might see the CO2 ice, but when we're off in the, per the permafrost ground in Mars, that's not what we're going to see. It's going to be more like this, but even then, eight meters. So that's pretty good. Um, and it's for um, this site right in here. So you can see the sediment, the buried ice with internal layering, and the moraine. So very exciting to see what's going to happen. And uh, yeah, so any questions? Thank you for listening.
Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, we measured them. Oh, um, okay. The average polygon would range from about half the size of half of this room to this. Okay, so if I'm looking here, I would have from here back to the back and from that middle section to halfway through here, that would be the typical size of one polygon. But I also saw polygons that were double that size. Would that be age dependent? <clears throat> no. The, the lateral dimension is not age dependent. The depth of the crack and the height of the depth of the ridge, that's age dependent. So the older they are, because the ice what the ice does is sublimates. And so you and you tend to sublimate preferentially from where the crack is forming. Oh, yeah. Why polygonal? Why not square or triangular? Well, some of them are hexagonal, some of them are quadrilateral, some I mean common angles or no? Well, no, it, it, that's just it. Uh, people have excavated some of them, but from our radar, it looks like it, the cracks could go in all kinds of different directions. I suspect the ones on the young polygons that we saw that were dipping may be due because, to the fact that they were at the base of a slope, and so the subsurface might be like a rock glacier flowing and carrying, deforming that, so it was actually taking some of those cracks and transporting them down slope a little bit. But that's just a hypothesis for which I have, you know, yeah. Could the fluid in Mars be anything but water causing the polygons there? Oh, it's probably CO2. The, the, it's the, probably the, the frozen carbon dioxide because that's what the poles are. That's what the polar ice caps are, is, is frozen CO2. But would it have the appropriate viscosity to cause that? Because you seem to say they're comparable size and comparable shape. Um. I think it's just the freeze-thaw process and the fact that you get these cracks uh, then forming because of the, free, the freeze-thaw and the sublimation, so you get the material falling in. Once the crack forms, once the crack forms, then it just keep, continues growing in there. And so it's, a, it just, it's like um, with faults. Once you find a weakness in the rock, the fault keeps rupturing in much the same place. It doesn't, form, it doesn't crack in a different place the next time. It always cracks in much the same place. There's another, oh. So we're, the robots <coughs> on Mars are those. Uh, oh, and, then, and just in the, in the polar regions, just the south, or just uh, equatorward from the, um, from the polar regions. So there's, I guess, subpolar. Latitude is where the previous lander was? That was Phoenix, yeah. That was the Phoenix lander, yeah. Yeah. Can you get any data from satellites? Oh, that's where some of the Martian uh, information has come, actually, is from, sa is from satellites. And that's where we know that it's CO2 at the, the poles. Oh, yeah, there's some from that, but not for the polygons. It's, it's, it, it's, um, they're too small scale. So, yes? You mentioned there was alpine polygons as well? Yes. Consistent with the same structure? Well, it depends on the climate. Um, the ones that are in humid climates are going to be like the Arctic polygons. You see, the Arctic is actually more of a humid uh, polar climate. Antarctica is a dry polar climate. So it turns out that the mechanisms for the polygons in the Arctic and the Antarctic are different. And so it will be the same for the, the high alpine polygons, depending on whether the humid setting where you get water percolating in and then freezing and making the crack, or in Antarctica where the, the cracks form because of the ice, uh, re, you know, the water refreezing in the active layer, and then it, the cracks and the material falls in. Um, so they form, have slightly different mechanisms, but we see them you know, on, in, the, in the alpine areas, and it depends whether it's a humid or dry climate. The mechanisms for their formation, but they they follow the same processes. Someone in the back? Oh, oh, yeah. You, you mentioned okay, it's permafrost areas, and you notice this in. So in warmer areas, then is that's where you would find linear or parallel lines or star shape, where the water is more surface and flowing? Well, that's just it. You see, you, if you don't have, 
if you don't have permafrost, you're not going to have these kinds of formations. Um, I mean, if you think about it here, we, where we, we get the freeze-thaw, but we don't see polygons, because this is temperate. Um, Going back to the earlier question, then, why are they closed polygons as opposed to open? Uh, I'm going to have to pass on that because I don't know the engineering dynamics of the formation of the polygons. Now, people have worked on that and tried to explain that, but nature likes these kinds of patterns. You see it in all kinds of things forming again and again and again, that the stresses involved, you end up seeing these kinds of shapes showing up in nature. And it's just the way the stresses get distributed. It seems to be the most efficient and effective way of distributing the stresses and taking them up. Yeah? With your subsurface uh, scaps, how deep are you actually going in those two valleys? Uh, the results that you showed. Oh, okay. Um, let me see if I can go back. Um, so in this case, with this, we're getting, um, with the high frequency, we're getting um, the scale here. Um, see, that's 5, 10, 15, 20. So here we're, we're getting about 15 to 20 meters. Uh, but when we did the transect, we used 50 megahertz, and we were easily getting 20 to 30 meters penetration, which is quite exciting, really. You know, you can really see some some cool stuff. Do you have any idea about how deep it goes? Ah, no. But we we did some other techniques called um, a transient electromagnetics and that can get down 100 meters, and we saw a brine layer, a very salt-rich layer at depth, and people have observed this sort of thing with drill holes near the lakes. The lakes have fresh water floating on top and underneath it's salt water. So they get hypersaline, so you basically freeze the ice, the salt out. Yeah. Uh, so what can we tell about Mars based on your study, other than that there is a freeze thaw cycle? Um, it needs more work, and they're going to send another lander with radar. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's the thing. There's always something new to find out. So, for example, the work we did with this, you know, it was the sort of thing where we saw this deformation, so no more work needs to be done, but we also saw that. And we went, wow, let's go back. And everyone said, no, we're not going to give you the money. So... So, <laughs> mm, yeah, it's a, no, it's, it's, it's exciting. And one of the people who was working on this with us, um, Ron Sletton, was involved with the Curiosity um, lander as well. So that's the nice thing. You see, he's being, he works in Greenland, Antarctica, and Mars. <laughs> and by the way, um, do any of the kids have any questions? Okay, that's because I had a slide all prepared for somebody to ask. Um, how do we go to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> See, I was all prepared because any time I've given this quest, uh, given this talk before, um, <laughs> at night in our tents we have pee bottles, and they're very carefully labeled to distinguish them from the water bottles. Um, and then this is our throne room. Um, notice that the wind break that's been put up, um, and it's well away from the camp. And so there's a little bit of privacy as well. It's, this is not. This is both a privacy shelter and a wind break. Um, but uh, yeah, you. It is quick. You don't want to expose uh, too much for too long. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually. There were days it was up around 10 Celsius, you know, because it's 24-hour sunlight. But there are also days I uh, bet it got down to minus 10. Yeah. So when, when exactly was this? Uh, this was uh, December, January 2006, 2007. Ah, uh, so summer. 
Yes, that's right. Oh, you don't go to Ant people winter over in Antarctica, but they do not venture very far from the camps. No, no. So you said Antarctica is fragile. So, what did you do with the waste? Whatever we took in, we took out. And so, when I was medevaced, I got taken out with the waste. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, when we, we when we leave, everything goes. Including all the waste. All everything. Waste. Everything. The only thing that's left behind are our footprints, which can last years. Eventually they get wiped out by the wind, but they can last years. So we always walk the same path every day to get to the site to minimize the footprint of the damage. Um Whatever water we brought in was for drinking, and then we had pee bottles for what was left over. Um, John Lapwood, um, actually, after a while, we started rationing his tea. Yes, you can take the rest of it that's for yourselves and, and extrapolate that. Um, but yeah, it's, and as I say, I'd do it again in a minute. Oh, yes. What's the length of a typical trip? Oh, there isn't. Um, in 2001, 2002, I went to the dry valleys for just a week. This, we went, flew out November 29th. I was medevaced December 27th when they went to Beacon Valley, and they finally arrived back in New Zealand January 26th. So they actually camped out for almost two months. Um, I was there for a month, almost. So. How's your knee now? It clicks, but you know. <laughs> but. It won't stop you from going back. Just money. Oh, just money. It won't stop me going back. No. Did you go because you knew about polygon shapes? Or? Yes, I knew, I went because of the polygons, um, but also we we were interested in the polygons, but then Ron Sletton. Got, got in touch with us, we talked with him, and it turns out there were more fundamental issues involved in the polygon formation, and we were able to be involved in that. But I got interested in the polygons because in our previous work, we were looking at contaminants, because anywhere people go, we leave stuff behind. And we were looking at oil spills, fuel spills. In fact, there is a drill hole not far away from this site uh, where they used diesel as the drilling fluid because water would freeze. And they had, they had a pipe, and they assumed that the pipe would remain, you know, a nice steel pipe would maintain its integrity, but within a very short time it rusted out and diesel started spilling. So we wanted to map the extent of the diesel, and using the geophysical techniques, we can. We found a nice signal in Scott Base and nice signal in a place called Marble Point, where they almost had a U.S. Uh, Antarctic base. But here, the polygons interfered with the signal, and so we had this overprint of the polygon signal on the signal of the contaminant. And of course, people would say, well, let's just do tests, let's just dig it out. As soon as you dig it out, it disturbs the permafrost, disturbs the whole thermal cycle. And so then it changes how things move. So it's actually better to just leave the stuff where it is, figure out where it is, and then try and figure out how to get rid of it, because as soon as you try and clean it up, you disturb the site more than it was before. So this is why when we go in now, especially the dry valleys, it's a special area. You go in and you have to have a whole environmental plan, and we did move on, we actually helped develop it. And everything that went in, Got brought out. Yeah. You mentioned taking a core sample. Would that how how big is a core sample? Would that just uh, disturb the environment? Not like that. Small. It's not very big. It's the drilling instead, and the drilling fluid. And now there there'd be all kinds of environmental controls on the on the drilling. They'd be, have to be very very careful. But there's a company in New Zealand that now that has actually been down there a few times and specializes in that kind of thing. Yeah. Some people think you know, the polygons are 8.1 million years. In Beacon Valley, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, how old do you think they are? I don't think they're more than a million. Um, it's, it's all controversial, and there are people who've gone into Victoria Valley here and mapped what they think along these hills. They've gone around with, with all the snow melted. They've gone around and mapped what they think are an old shoreline. And I think there was an old a lake there, or maybe, you know, a glacier fill. And again, that's controversial because you look, you get the, the same forms, and two different people may interpret them in different ways. And they can justify their interpretation based on the things they've seen before. And this is the thing we have to keep in mind in science is we often go in with models, preconceived models. And so we often take our data and, and shoehorn them into those models. And this is actually another area I've worked on, is um, a colleague and I have actually uh, submitted a paper to a journal on challenging paradigms and misconceptions in geophysics. And the subtitle is Let the Data Speak. And often we don't let the data tell its story, or the data can be ambiguous, and that's where we have to be careful. But nature often finds a way, finds a middle ground. Um, it sounds like something out of Jurassic Park, doesn't it? Um, but, um, I mean, look at mantle convection. What, uh, how, how many decades ago I was doing my PhD, and people thought about that mantle convection. They, there were these people who thought it was a layered upper mantle, lower mantle, and those who thought it was whole mantle convection. And they argued. I mean, they were passionately opposed. And the problem was the evidence went both ways. You could, you could find evidence for either. And now we've been able to get really fantastic seismic tomography on the Earth. And you know what? It's somewhere in between. We have, they discovered there's something called, um, what do they call it? It's uh, slushy subduction, where a slab goes down, it reaches that 700 kilometer discontinuity, and it melts and it drips through. So you have something like a combination of layered mantle and whole mantle convection. So the answer is, is it layered or whole? Yes. <laughs> so nature often finds a way to confound us, but that's exciting. I think that's a good place to finish. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Once a year. <laughs> oh, oh, very good. Well, I'm just going to we'll we'll point out that ISS pass is starting in about nine minutes or so. <laughs> so if anybody we'll wants to see it. Is it clear? I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't very clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, Someone's about to go. It's kind of okay. Perfect. Uh, I'll call on our president, Ralph Chu, to present uh, the uh, announcements. <laughs> Boy, talk about pressure. <laughs> I'm sorry I took so long answering questions. Uh, that's great having the questions. Okay, so let's see what we can do here with the, um, uh, the announcements. Did I hit the right one? Yeah, you did. Uh, okay, you got it. There you go. Okay, so uh, we'll go back one, hopefully. Oh dear, I, I have blown it. I had it and then I screwed it up. I'll let Andrew uh, put it back. So our next meeting is the Recreational Astronomy Night on September 13th. Uh, we will have a sky this month, but we're not quite sure who the speaker is at this point. Uh, Dennis is going to be talking about a dome of his own, and uh, then uh, hopefully we will have some good reports on the solar eclipse and uh, the various uh, expeditions uh, that are leaving over the next few days. Okay, let's see. Let me do it. Yeah, I'll let you do that, Andrew. Okay, speakers' night uh, on September 27th, and uh, I'm very happy to announced this as the first Charles Darrow lecture, uh, which will be co-sponsored between uh, 
the Toronto Centre, the Ontario Science Centre, and Professor Sarah Seeger, who has very kindly offered to set up a series of talks funded by her uh, over the next few years. And so uh, this is going to be a very big occasion. Uh, Jill Tarter is coming up from the SETI Institute to speak. Uh, there will be a whole week of um, things connected with her visit, uh, which will include the University of Toronto and York University as well. And um, again, uh, Sarah Seeger will be here to kick off that uh, along with Charles. So uh, a really, really big program there. Uh, we are actually going to be holding that talk in the main auditorium. Uh, and uh, over the next little while, uh, what will happen is, uh, and we'll hear from Rachel about this uh, by email, there will be a, a special ticketing arrangement for Toronto Centre members. Uh, this is a combined public and private lecture. Toronto Centre has 200 free seats available to us, and uh, if we don't take them all up, we will offer them to uh, other centres in the area. The other 200 will be sold to the general public. So. Uh, again, it's a big deal. Also, uh, this is the first of a special series of lectures that the Ontario Science Centre is putting on starting this fall. Rachel, do you remember what the uh, title of the series is? It's called Great Conversations. Yeah. I will be announcing uh, the lineup of speakers very, very shortly over the next few weeks, but it's very exciting. Right. Okay, so for those of you online, uh, just to repeat what Rachel said, uh, it's a series called Great Conversations. So. Again, uh, details will be available on the Science Center website, and we'll put it on our website as the information comes on. Okay, uh, as far as observing is concerned, we have our solar observing uh, on uh, uh, Saturday, and hopefully it will be clear. Apparently, it looks like the rainstorms should blow through on uh, Friday and leave us with a reasonably good sky on Saturday. Uh, but Sean, uh, in the usual way, will make the go-no-go no go decision. Uh, what I'm going to do is come out for that uh, so that if people have specific questions about safe solar viewing, they can talk to me directly during that program. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the dark sky and uh, city skies parties. Again, uh, this was something that uh, Dennis mentioned in his presentation, First Clear Nights. Uh, of the weeks of the 21st for the dark sky and the 28th for city star parties. So again, watch on the website and our usual media outlets for the go, no go calls. Next slide, please. Uh, as we also mentioned earlier uh, in Dennis's talk, we do have uh, uh, the August 21st uh, solar eclipse program going on. Our main site will be here at the Science Center. And again, we do need volunteers to help us with this. We expect a lot of people turning out, even if it is a work day. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of kids may be here. And uh, again, the more telescopes and uh, people to supervise uh, solar viewing, the better. Uh, Dunlap Institute is doing things down at the um, uh, exhibition. And again, uh, they have a number of telescopes being set up, but they probably can use some help. And we have a program going on also at the CAO. So again, another major outreach effort. Tom? Yeah, um, well, even if you have no solar observing gear, but you are familiar with using a telescope, we need you because we will have a number of the club's PSTs, the personal solar telescopes, on mounts ready for use. So we will need people to uh, babysit those scopes. So even if you don't have your own scope, but are familiar with doing outreach from star parties, we will have gear for you. Thank you. So again, to repeat for those online, uh, we do have center PSTs that will be set up. So if you can come out, uh, we'll have telescopes for you to supervise. Okay, next slide, please. I just want to mention that at the Science Center here, we're going to be starting right when we open at 10 with right. uh, solar observing. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, again, there will be uh, telescope viewing from 10 o'clock on. And uh, although the main interest will be about 12.30 uh, as we approach eclipse time. Okay, Millennium Square also has an event uh, going on on the 25th of August. So this is going to be a busy period. Uh, their last uh, outreach program, they uh, had 1,100 visitors in the evening. And so this is a, another area where we do need 
uh, volunteers to help out because again, uh, the numbers are, are growing in that area. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, just a reminder that the CAO is always available to you, especially in the summer season. Uh, although uh, we do have supervisors on site on the weekends, remember that it is available to you during the week as well if you want to use it. Uh, in your holiday time, you can book the uh, site uh, online. Next slide, please. A reminder also that the Telescope Loan Program is active. We have uh, all three of our, uh, no, two of our um, uh, loan uh, managers here tonight. So if you are uh, looking for information, please uh, talk with them. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen the website in a while, but we have a new five inch, fairly portable uh, dog added to the uh, collection. It's totally new, so the C8 has a brand new day. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we've got a lot of new stuff uh, coming online and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Next slide, please. Finally, meeting after the meeting, after the ISS, and that is uh, if you have the time to spare, a uh, few of us will be making our way over to the meeting over at the Granite. So uh, please join us there. So that's it for this evening. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. Thank you to those of you online. Uh, just a reminder, anybody in the audience, if you need solar filters, uh, they are here. Please take them and use them. Good night, everybody.